Science has nothing to do with empathy. Quote, unquote. Hi, my name's Alex. I've argued enough for a lifetime. If you'd like to know more about nature, how we find out about it, and how all of this relates back to being kind in our daily lives, please consider subscribing, hitting the bell, and sharing. I can't promise that you'll find answers in single videos, but it's all there in the channel as a whole. On to empathy in science. That quote in the beginning there was buried in a direct message thesis on Twitter the other day. A user had found my video on science leadership empathy and story. He basically attacked the whole premise of the piece. He did so in a long-winded, polite, but unmistakable manner. Science is a method. It is dry. It is not personal. And he's right in the way that he meant it. But science doesn't exist in a vacuum. He, he misunderstood the piece, and even that is fine too, in the given context. As a communicator, I have to choose my audience, by the way, then communicate to that audience. And sometimes, as a communicator, I fail to do it perfectly. But that's just on a side note. The rest of what ended up being a good and thorough, as well as respectful conversation, shall remain private between this particular Twitter user and me. It got me thinking, though. Science, this high-rising, emotionless, ivory tower of reason. <laughs> it's worth exploring a little more how applying science to problems teaches you empathy. Because it certainly does. It starts with you. One of the tenets of science, this simple idea of asking a checkable question and then going ahead and, well, checking it, is that you yourself are the most likely person to be fooled by whatever observation or experiment you set up. See, even formulating a question in such a way that it can be checked, that is, tested properly, requires thinking. And whenever we start thinking about something, we end up having inklings, gut feelings, or even opinions. It's human nature. That's who we are. And the moment we have one or all of these, our sense for pattern recognition kicks in and we may see things that aren't there. Who of you thought of Gandalf and the Balrog even before the text appeared? Before you say anything, I don't want to say that you really think this is a rendering of Peter Jackson's vision of a Balrog. It's an object called W40, which I have put sideways and given a different color. That's all. But here's an example that will hit much closer to home for at least some of you. Imagine you're a young man. You fall for a young woman. You hit on her. And yes, I want to infer exactly what this sounds like. She doesn't want you to hit on her. You think she plays hard to get. An age-old story unfolds, hopefully with a better ending for her than for you. Somebody convinced himself into a reality that didn't exist. Somebody fooled himself. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not condemning anybody. I could, because that example there has very real implications to people's lives when playing out. But I won't. I just want to point out the parallels to a scientist's need to, say, produce papers and conference talks or even books on her subject because that's how the money grant given to the scientist is measured. Well, maybe you see something in your data that is enticing towards such an end, a peak in the data that could in fact mean that you will break some ground. And remember what I said just a minute ago, the mere act of thinking pushes you in the same mental direction to start with. Remember too how both Gandalf and Galadriel were happy to not have taken the ring from Frodo, despite the Hobbit offering it to both. That's what this is. 
You're so close. This could just not be a breakthrough in science. This could be a breakthrough in your career, in your life. The temptation of it all. Then of course most scientists have trained and are trained properly to tackle just such moments. They're as prepared as Gandalf and Galadriel were. An immeasurable majority of scientists makes the same choice too. The choice itself, though, is not connected to such clear-cut points in time as for the Elven Queen and the Wizard. One of the tenets of science is the idea that you yourself are the most likely person to be fooled by you. Quote, unquote. Think about what that really means. In order to not fool yourself, you need to realize your situation as close to fully as possible at every moment. Am I too tired to see everything that I need to see? What perspective am I missing in the assumptions to my calculations? Or even, am I well enough to do this right now? Am I well enough to be confident in what I'm doing? A lifetime of asking yourself questions like this, being conscious about it too, what does that look like? As a scientist of some experience, you will have a tendency to know yourself rather well. You will know your triggers, when to step back and do something else, when to step up and do it, whatever it is. Not every scientist will listen to herself and actually step back or step up in the right moment. But by far the most know when they should, and by far the most do. Don't let the odd counterexample fool you. Long story short, scientists are empathetic towards themselves. So, don't be surprised to find a scientist taking the logical next step and be empathetic to her surroundings, too.